John chapter 10, and I'm going to start at verse 19 and read through 30. Please listen carefully, for this is God's word. Therefore, there was a division again among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, He has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Now it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So ends the reading of the Word. So as we progress through uh, the Gospel of John, we're at the point now where there's no longer any room for indecision. Jesus must either be uh, declared a blasphemer or become the object of belief. You see, in Jesus, God represents his sheep. And he cares for every need, and, and he fights on our behalf. And when we have such a great God like that, think about it. It's a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd, our God and Savior. And he's, he's never going to leave us alone. He's always there working in our life, working sanctification. And, and he forgives us constantly, forgiving us every day, restoring us back to fellowship. What should our response be back to him? Obedience and worship. Not to gain merit, not to uh, get more favor from him, but because to show him how much we love him. Now, verses 19 through 21, <clears throat> there goes my voice again, I don't know what's going on. Verse 19 through 21 says, Therefore there was a division, what a lovely word, isn't it? There was a division among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, He has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So ends the reading. That's horrible. That's absolutely horrible. Horrible accusations are being hurled at Jesus, calling him insane and demon-possessed. You know what this is? This is the proof of the wickedness of the human heart, calling God demon-possessed. Personally, I think that's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, but that's another story. Jesus Christ, I just uh, take Ben-Hur, matter of fact. I don't know if you guys saw that on Turner Music Classic. But you just picture Jesus Christ is walking into this church right now and sitting down in a pew. His sinlessness would convict all of us. They show a really good part in Ben-Hur when that happens. But when Christ was walking the earth, he stood out because of his sinlessness. And they couldn't put their finger on it. He kept claiming to be God. And they had, we don't know people's innards, uh, inside, their motives, their beliefs and all that. But I'm telling you, they had to have, they knew what he was saying. And yet they called him demon possessed. Now some of the crowd, and some within the crowd, disagreed with the accusations. But notice that they made no attempt to say what he is. You know, what that shows me is we can be very sentimental and sincere, but we're still going to hell. You, you know, I think that, that that's a lot of what characterizes not only our culture, but around the world. You know, you, you believe in Jesus, that you just keep it to yourself, that's okay. I have my own spirituality over here. I'm a nice person, I'm a nice neighbor, I'm a good neighbor. But, you know, we have to understand what truth is. And truth is found in the Bible. And we have to have that relationship with Jesus Christ. 
I mean, we can discuss God, and I say God in the generic term. If you notice, uh, God's always, uh, everybody believes in a God, okay? It can be God and Muhammad, God uh, in every different religion, Hinduism, Buddhism, all of them. They believe in a God. We even get to the point now in our culture that we think we're God. The spirituality inside of us. And so you can talk about generic God, everybody's fine. Or you can talk about spirituality, how you're a good person and you're working your way to nirvana. But when you, when, but when you even come close to talking about the biblical Christ, that's when everything gets upheaval. Leave your biblical Christ at home. And we can talk about God in a generic term and spirituality and not even come close to introducing somebody to the biblical Christ. God is fine if you use a generic term. And spirituality is even better. But Jesus is a fancy. The biblical Christ is a fancy. But you know what? The offense is that we don't tell people they are dying and need Christ. For the Christian, for everyone in this room, it is a fancy not to proclaim the gospel, knowing that we're going to be mocked and per persecuted and hated, just as Jesus was. Now they're calling him insane. Now they're saying he's demon-possessed. This crowd hates the biblical Christ. And, and what did Jesus say? Where is it? It's in Matthew, I mean, uh, John somewhere between 14 and 17. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. So we don't let that, don't ever shy away from that. Now, what's causing a division here? The words or teaching of Jesus is what's causing the division. Some respond negatively. He's demons. This. He's got it. He's, he's insane. Where others, and I get this, respond positively. They don't say, well, how can he be insane or demons? This? He heals people. But both, both views don't know the real Christ. It's his sheep. And this is what we've been going through in John chapter 10. Those who are born again and have the ability to listen to Jesus. We have the ears to hear, the eyes to see. Uh, it, we hear his voice back in verse 3. We know his voice in verse 4. And we, don't, we will not follow the voice of a stranger in verse 5. That's the difference. Now in verse 22 and 23 it says, Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Now, this ends the reading, but these two verses, two months have passed, okay, from verse 21 to verse 22. And it's time, it was time at this point to celebrate the Feast of Dedication, which landed on the 25th of Cheslib, which is what we call the modern-day Hanukkah. It's actually December 25th. And, and the feast was initiated by Judas Maccabus. You probably heard of him as Judas the Hammer back in 165 BC. And it was to celebrate the cleansing of the temple after Antiochus Ep Epiphany had defiled it by sacrificing a pig on the altar of burnt offering. Remember him? He's the one in Daniel chapter 11 that I believe in the Bible's saying this is going to picture the modern day Antichrist when he comes. This was supposed to, what you see in Antiochus Epiphanes, however you say his name, should I ask my brother how to say it, <laughs> whenever he, he's a, a, a forerunner of the actual Antichrist that would come. <clears throat> and what did Epiphanes, Epiphanes means a revelation of God or God manifest. <laughs> he came to rule over the area and he attempted to mix Hebrew and Greek culture. And he turned the temple into a brothel and converted the altar to the altar worship of Zeus, and he murdered many Jews. And that's when Judas and his family and a band of army came in and cleansed it. Now, what's going to happen in the, in whenever the Antichrist comes? That's a picture of the actual Antichrist that comes. You know, back in, I don't know, the 14th, 15th century, uh, what the church did was they, they knew that Satan's uh, uh, vulnerability was his pride. He was the most beautiful creature God ever made. He was full of pride. 
And so what they did is they made mockings of him. Like they put a, horns on him and they put a red suit on him and like a, a hoofs on him and stuff. And they make these pictures of Satan. That's where we get it today from like Halloween and stuff. And they did it in order to mock him, make him look like a jester in order to attack his pride. But what happened was a generation later, and this is why it's important to always keep your kids, uh, try and ground them in the faith, because a generation later, the kids of these church that was doing this didn't know why they had these pictures of Satan like this. And they thought, what were my parents involved with, this mythology? Who could be afraid of somebody like that? And that's how we view Satan today. You know in the Lord's Prayer, when it says, deliver us from evil? That word evil, now I don't know how many translations have this, but that word evil, in the best manuscripts we have, I'll say the original, was in the uh, neuter. And it was poneron. Neuter meaning, not, I have it the other way around. In our, a lot of our modern day translations and how you probably learned the Lord's Prayer when it says, deliver us from evil, it was in the neuter, poneron, meaning an old end ending in Greek, which means uh, it could be like a force, or it, it wasn't a certain person. But in our best manuscripts that we have in the original, it was in the first singular masculine with an OS ending, poneros, is the actual ending of that. And what that means, is it's actually a person. It's delivers from Satan, delivers from the evil one. You see, when you, a lot of people today think like sin is just in force, okay? But sin is actually, Satan is actually a person, okay, that tempts each one of us, him and his hordes of demons. And so what's going to happen is when the Antichrist comes, it's going to be a picture of, of Daniel 11. But he's not going to come with horns on. He's not going to come this evil, this scheming person. He's going to come as an angel of light. He's going to come like a Billy Graham. Not saying that he is, obviously. But he's going to come as a religious person that, that, that everybody's going to be attracted to. And then he's going to unleash the tribulation. Okay, but the point is, 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 this is what's going on here. Anyway, I don't know why I diverted there. But anyway, verse 24, when it says, Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. So ends the reading. Now, once again, the, the, all the different commentaries I go through, they all agreed on one thing. This is a hard <laughs> verse to interpret. Because the actual saying is, How long will you take away our life? That's the actual saying. And what it was is probably a, a, a saying that they had back then. And so a lot of translations, like the New King James has, how long do you keep us in doubt? That's pretty good. How long do you keep us in suspense? But what it's saying, so you, what you do is you, you, you use the word surround. You, you, Jesus, then the Jews surrounded him. And that word for surrounded is a word that's describing a hostile intent. Okay, this crowd was... In, it was in rebellion against Christ. They wanted to kill him. And then you go down and you say, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. So it's a good translation that we have. They're coming with evil intent, and they complain that Christ is, is talking in gibberish. We don't understand what he's saying. Because how many times up to that point did Jesus say, I am that I am the door. I and my Father are working. He's going to get to the verse 30, I and my Father are one. I don't know how many times he told him, I am God manifest in the flesh. I am the Messiah. And, and, and they're saying, you, you're, not, you're talking in riddles. You, we don't understand what you're saying. Yes, they did. They understood exactly what he was saying. But the problem is they would like a Jesus to be the, a, a political Messiah. Someone who would drive out Rome and serve their agenda. And, you know, that's us today, beloved. That's us. Many of want a Christ who tells them what they want to hear, not the truth. They, they make up a Jesus in their own mind that, that serves them, that, that serves their agenda, that doesn't convict them of sin. Now, he's, the Jews say, tell us plainly, who are you? What are you saying to us? One wonders, if, they're, if, they, if you take that by face value, why do the Jews, if they don't understand what Jesus is saying, they say, 
If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. If you don't understand what Jesus is saying, why do you want to kill him? Okay? They understood exactly what he's saying. That's why they want to kill him. And, and they just don't have the, the eyes to see or the ears to hear. People understand they're sinners and they need a Savior. Don't ever shy away from witnessing to somebody. Take those tracks back there because there's one thing they know. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to know the Greek and Hebrew. You don't have to know all the conjunctions and sit there and write out a 50-page scenario on what it means to be saved. Just tell them you're a sinner and you need Christ. They, everybody knows that. Everybody knows they're a sinner and they need a Savior. In verse 25 and 26, it says, Jesus answered them, I told you you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. So ends the reading. So once again, Jesus says, I did tell you. And, and he's, it's not so much a specific statement that Jesus is saying, but it's the thrust of his entire ministry and teaching that he's plainly telling them, I am the Messiah, not the Messiah you're looking for, but I come in my Father's name, I'm fulfilling his perfect will. By the way, I'm sinless. I'm sure he's, somebody said that to him. And, but the fact that the Jews keep rejecting Jesus was proof of their rejection of God. There is no God without Jesus. That's why I say we can talk about God in a generic term. You know, I believe in God. Everyone says that. And there's different gods for every different religion. But there's no belief without the biblical Christ. There's no belief with Jesus. That's why we as Christians say, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. To us, it's just natural. It's just what you say. But to the world that's dead in their sin, they're saying, you are narrow-minded. I didn't realize Ken and Marianne and Brenda are so narrow-minded. I've been told that. A good friend of mine. At Boise, I've told you before, I, I worked with him for years. And he, he, he said, you're saying you have to believe exactly like you. You keep, what about all those people that don't believe in Jesus the only way? What about all the other different religions? Whoa, am I saying that? And I thought, I guess I am, all right. But it is, that's what we're saying to people. It's only through Christ, not through any other way to get to uh, um, God. Now, the issue isn't intellectual, okay? The issue isn't, if I have more study, maybe it'll clear things up and then I can understand what you're saying. The issue is spiritual. They didn't have the ears to hear or the eyes to see, which builds upon what we saw last week, verses 1 through 18. And it matches what, what was being said about no one being able to come to him unless the Father draws him. That goes back in John 6, 44. In John 6, 44, it says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And then in verse 45, It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. See, the, the problem is, that's why Jesus is saying, the reason you don't hear me, the reason that you don't believe is because you're not of my sheep. I don't know how much clearer we have to get here. In John 27 through 28, it says, My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. So when it's a reading, that word snatch is the same word that's it's hopazo in Greek. It's the same word for the rapture. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Where is it in 1 Thessalonians 4? They'll be caught up to heaven. That... That's the word that's being used here, snatched. That's what was going to happen at the rapture. You're going to be snatched out of here. That's the word that's being used here. 
uh, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Yeah, that includes you. You can't take yourself out of God's hand. He's not going to allow that to happen. But, you know, those who refuse to listen to Jesus' voice are not a sheep. That's what he's saying. We recognize Christ's voice when he speaks to us through the Bible. That's why Paul has a certain view that he has when he reads the Bible. That's why Irma does. Because, beloved, you're, the Holy Spirit's revealing who Jesus is in truth when you're reading the Bible. And, and, and John, he's using what they call an, a, a double negative to enforce an idea that no one can snatch his sheep out of his hand. He's saying they will certainly never, ever, ever perish. That's how it's being translated. There's no way. If God says it, then it, that's what it means. In verse 29, when it says, My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch him out of my father's hand. So in verse 29, again, we have my father who has given them to me. You know, back in John 6, I think it's 65. And it says... And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. And that's what Jesus is saying again. My Father has given them to me. Each one of us in this room, the Father has given us to Christ. We're his sheep now. When Jesus says that the Father uh, gave the sheep to him, he's, he's going back to what John has already put in John chapter 6. I didn't mention this last week, but uh, Greek again, it's Hooper, okay? And, and back in when he says, I, uh, Christ died for a sheep, the words being used when it said died for a sheep is a word that means atonement, okay? It means Christ died for you on the cross. That's what the word's being used here. Did you go to verse 30 and says, I and my father are one. Now, this is where the division comes in. Because remember I was talking about Satan and Dillos from evil? That was in the, uh, wrongly translating the neuter. It should be first masculine, meaning a person. It should be uh, uh, the evil one. Not just the, the evil, but the evil one. Now this is in the neuter. Meaning, since it's in the neuter, it's it, it, it's the, the son and the father are not the same person. If, if he were to use first masculine, singular, then you would be able to have modulism, which is a heretical view today, saying that it's like there's one God, not three persons, but just one God, and it's like they wear a mask. It's like when, when Jesus... Um, was on the earth, God wasn't in heaven. He's taken on in the Holy Spirit. It's like God's Spirit, but it's it, 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 oneness Pentecostal have this view. Okay, oneness Pentecostal. And there's other denominations that are saying it's not three distinct persons, but one God. Now, I was going to bring my phone up here because I, I thought about this. And, and, uh, the Greek is so exact in its interpretation. I don't know if you've, if you've talked into groups that deny the Trinity, that deny uh, the deity of Christ, they're always going to, when you try and bring up Greek, they're going to say to you, oh, you're brainwashed by Aristotle, Greek. Okay, I don't, I've been told that several times. But you know what we have today? We have the smartphone. And all you have to do is go to like, Speak into your phone and say, like, what is the Greek word for only begotten in John 1, 14 and John 3, 16? And it's going to come up. And it's the word monogeneus, which means one of a kind. And it's used nine times. Okay? It means peculiar generation. It means, a lot of translations have one and only God. That's what it means. Now, if he were to use the other word, genoneo, which is used several hundred times, it's a common word, 
Sylvia should know this because it's all of her favorite verses. Begot this, begot this, begot this person, begot this person, begot this person. That's the word being used. That's not the word that's used. But when somebody reads the Bible, they can see the only begotten Son of God. Or John 1, 14, flesh, the, the only begotten Son. And they think, is what they're doing, is they're going from English to English. They think begotten automatically means creation, being created. So they go and they start saying, well, it says begotten means that Christ had to have a beginning, right? It's a creature. He's a creature. That's what they harp on. And I thought to myself, now that we have the smartphones, and you can get anything on the smartphone, I wonder how many people, that's all they have, it's a blessing. Because those people sitting in those pews can Google anything they want. They can Google what does begotten mean. And they can, it'll tell you on the, on the, in the Greek. The Lord can use that. Because I'm telling you, that that's how exact Greek is. And, and the people know what Christ is saying when he keeps saying, I am God. Now, what's the, when he says, I and my Father are one, and he has it in the neuter, it means it's not one distinct person. If he were to use the masculine, it would have been like Satan, uh, a person, but he's not, he's using the neuter, which means we're two separate people, but we have one essence. It's one God. And that's what he's saying. Uh, and that's why they're going to pick up stones and stone him. Because they knew, because I remember they said, you tell us plainly you're the Christ. You keep speaking in riddles. No, they knew exactly what Jesus is saying. And everybody in this world knows exactly that they're sinners and that they need a Savior. And I can't help but think, this is only my opinion, even the person, let's say, that's deep in Buddhism, that thinks there's ten different ways up the mountain to reach God, I think deep inside they know, deep inside they know that Christ is the only way. 